Hello, I'm Anne Curry, the Dean of the Faculty, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, here tonight. These are always very special occasions. This is the first of the year. There are another three after this, plus the Amnesty International Lecture uh, that we have, and of course the regular Parks and Montefiore uh, lectures as well. And so I do hope we'll see you at some of those uh, too. Now, it's a tradition at these lectures for a charity collection to be taken at the end, and tonight's is in support of uh, Lymphoma Association. So at the end, these uh, yellow-clad young ladies who've been uh, ticking you off will be with collecting boxes, uh, so I do hope you will uh, feel able to, to contribute to that. The other good thing about these uh, lectures, in addition to hearing colleagues, because ironically we, you know, we hear colleagues, but we don't hear them talking about their research very often. So it's great that Neela is, is going to uh, talk about what's such a fascinating topic. But the other good thing about these lectures is the opportunity to invite a distinguished historian and colleague and friend to introduce them. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce Jeremy Noakes who is Emeritus Professor of Modern European History at the University of Exeter. Um, I suspect many students in the room will know his work, particularly the four-volume Nazism, a documentary reader, which is probably the most single influential and well-known teaching text on this field in the world. But he was also a pioneer of the emergence of critical historiography on the Third Reich. His first book, on the rise of the Nazi party in Lower Saxony, published in 1971, remains unsurpassed despite the massive amount of work that has gone on uh, in the interim. There's very much a, a canonical text. He's followed with equally pioneering work on the Nazi state, on regionalism in the Third Reich, and much more besides. So we're very delighted that he's taken time to come this evening to chair this lecture. So without more ado, I hand you over to Professor Jeremy Merckx. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I feel very honoured to uh, have been invited to uh, introduce the inaugural lecture of my former student, uh, Neil. Uh, during a long career teaching uh, university students, I think most people, if they're honest, from time to time are forced to admit, actually, this student is brighter than I am. <laughs> And certainly, Neil uh, comes into that uh, category. In fact, he is the brightest student um, I ever had the good fortune uh, to teach. He took three of my courses over three years, and so he had plenty of time uh, to rub it in. <laughs> but I wasn't alone in recognizing his quality. Uh, in his finals for the degree of history and German at Exeter, he gained first class marks in all 10 of his papers. Now. Uh, for single honours, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, for joint honours, uh, in my experience anyway, uh, it's unique. So you can imagine my delight when, uh, after he'd done his um, first degree, uh, he said that he'd like to do a PhD at Exeter under my supervision. In fact, I'd suggested he should <clears throat> go to St. Anthony's, my old um, uh, graduate college, which is one of the three center, main centers for research on modern German history. But no, uh, he said he wanted to do, uh, do it under me. So I was uh, very uh, chuffed uh, by that. He chose as his subject uh, the history of the big engineering firm Daimler-Benz <clears throat> during the Third Reich. It was his choice, and it wasn't an easy topic. Daimler-Benz couldn't be expected to be very happy about <coughs> the idea of having an Englishman uh, washing their dirty linen in public. And in fact, uh, it turned out that they were pretty forthcoming. But when it came to working in their Stuttgart archive, Neil had to add to the usual um, uh, historical skills uh, the quality, the almost, I was going to say, the, the, the skills of a spy, but that's, um, uh, I think, going too far, nothing uh, illegal, but the ability to charm um, archivists uh, to spot opportunities when they arose and to exploit them uh, meant getting access to material which perhaps wasn't uh, intended uh, to um, <coughs> appear in the light of day. <coughs> 
This was a very big and important subject. Daimler-Benz played uh, a key role in re German rearmament and in the war economy, and it raised interesting questions about the relationship between big business and the Nazi regime. <coughs> it required um, some knowledge of economics, business practices, and some technology in order to be able to understand why the firm took uh, decisions about producing um, uh, various uh, um, things and, uh, uh, and when and why. And Neil certainly did full justice uh, to it. And you can judge the significance of his thesis by the fact that it, before appearing in English, it was published in German by a major German publisher and uh, received a half-page review in the leading uh, German uh, journal, Die Zeit, uh, a very positive review written by one of the leading historians of Nazism, Hans Mommsen, um, who himself, in fact, went on to write a history of Volkswagen, in other words, uh, a leading expert in that particular field. And when it appeared in English, uh, published by the Yale University Press, uh, it was awarded the prestigious Frankel Prize uh, for Contemporary History, so uh, an absolute star uh, PhD. For his next major book, uh, Neil moved on to, uh, in time, from the Third Reich to the post-war uh, years, as they affected the city of Nuremberg. And he also moved on in terms of his historical approach. Uh, he started using the methodology of cultural history, and uh, to great effect. The book with the title Haunted City, Nuremberg and the Nazi uh, uh, Past, also published by Yale University Press, is an exceptionally perceptive and sensitive exploration of, of the ways in which <clears throat> the city of Nuremberg as a city of institutions and the population as a set of different uh, cultural and social and economic groups dealt with the aftermath uh, of war. How Nuremberg, for example, managed the influx of refugees pouring in uh, from Germany's former eastern territories how people coped with the loss of loved ones, and perhaps even more difficult with uh, relatives who were missing. How the city dealt with reconciling large numbers of ex-Nazis with those who'd been uh, in the resistance. And how it tried to create a modus vivendi uh, for its citizens in this new, very difficult post-war world. And finally, how it set about trying to restore its reputation, which had been, of course, as almost the quintessential Nazi city, the city of the uh, party, uh, Nazi party rallies. It's a brilliant book, and its quality was recognized by it being um, very quickly translated into German and by the award of the Frankel Prize. Receiving that award twice uh, is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, a unique achievement. But Neil hasn't confined himself to heavyweight uh, research monographs. He's also aware of the importance of communicating to a wider public. And a surprising feature of the historiography of Nazism is the lack of um, any work of any significance on Mein Kampf. Now at last, uh, 70 years after the end of the war, a uh, critical edition is actually being prepared of Mein Kampf. But um, in 2005, Neil uh, published uh, an excellent compact introductory monograph, How to Read Hitler, which, through a careful and in, um, lucid exposition of Hitler's ideas, I think fills the gap admirably for students and the general public wanting to uh, get to grips with this exceptionally unpleasant but very important book. During the past 50 years, the study of German history in Britain has been flourishing. It's been, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not uh, by chance that the two Regius professors of history at Oxford and Cambridge are both German historians at the moment, one in the early modern period and one in the modern period. And two of the handful of historians who've been uh, knighted um, are also German historians, Ian Kershaw and Richard Evans. One important aspect of this flourishing of German history has been the role played by the German History Society, founded in the early 
1970s. Uh, I was, in fact, its founding secretary, given great support by the German government, by the Volkswagen Foundation, and by German scholars. It played a huge role in the um, encouragement uh, of uh, German history, the study of German history in Britain. Uh, through its conferences, through uh, support for young scholars, financial support for young scholars, and not least through its journal, uh, German History. German History has become uh, one of the two leading um, historical journals specializing in German history in the English-speaking world, the other uh, being in the United States. And during the past decade, Neil has played a leading part in the German History Society as a member of the committee and currently as the editor of German history. Returning now, though, to Neil's research, two of its striking features, I think, are its range and its originality. And his current research provides an excellent example of this, because Neil, as you know, has now turned his attention to the social history of classical music in Germany during the 20th century. Classical music uh, has and continues to um, play, has played and continues to play a hugely important part in uh, German uh, cultural and uh, life in general um, during the 20th century. Much of it, much more I should say, than um, in comparable countries. Uh, I think um, if you've ever been to German ceremonial occasions, there's almost invariably uh, a quartet there uh, playing at some point uh, during, the, um, uh, during the occasion. It's enough to mention Wagner and Bayreuth, I think, to indicate its um, historical significance. But Wagner and Bayreuth are uh, not exceptions. Particular composers, particular pieces of music, Beethoven's Ninth, for example, um, particular styles of performance, even particular conductors, have, um, in Germany, resonances, have associations uh, that go far beyond the purely musicological. And the articles which Neil has published so far have, I think, already uh, shown the insights which such a socio-cultural history of music in Germany can provide. And I'm sure we're now all looking forward uh, to hearing what he's going to say about uh, Richard uh, Strauss. Like Wagner in the 19th century, Strauss played a very controversial role in 20th century German history. Uh, for a time, he was head of the Nazi uh, Chamber of Music. Uh, in fact, he ended up in disgrace um, because right at the end of the war, um, he appealed to Hitler to stop um, refugees being billeted on him uh, in his home, and the Nazi party um, bosses were, were very shocked by this. Uh, anyway, um, I think Strauss is a good example of uh, someone who, um, in their turbulent career, uh, reflected the turbulent times uh, in Germany in which they were living. Neil's lecture has the title, In Memoriam, Richard Strauss and the Legacy of War, uh, and I'd like to now hand you over to him. Thank you. I'm sure there are colleagues in the room who, who know what I'm trying to describe when, when, when I say that however much one gradually gets one's voice established in a small corner of one's chosen field, one, one never quite loses one's sense of unspoken amazement that one's permitted in the same room and in the same conversation, literally and metaphorically, as, as those people who not only did the work on which we, we try to build, but uh, in this case, called into existence, really, the, the very terrain on which we operate. So the, the, the pleasure and the privilege of, of having Jeremy uh, chair this uh, lecture are, are really all mine. And uh, likewise, I, I'd very much like to welcome Professor Leslie Sharp from the Department of German at the University of Exeter, which is a department to which I feel that I owe just as much, really. Uh, there's no 
better preparation for becoming a historian, or, or indeed for becoming much else, I'd like to say, than, than having your nose rubbed in three words and a comma of Schiller until you uh, come up with something intelligent to say about it. And I think these days we call that employability. But, you know. <laughs> Now, um, where should one start? Um, there's only ever one place, and that's with the most recent issue of German history. Just have this back. Which, um, quite by chance, is a special issue devoted to the subject of music, music in German history. We invited the distinguished cultural historian Celia Applegate to pull together a set of essays uh, reflecting on the ways in which historians might um, think about the diverse ways in which uh, music figured in the German past. Uh, now, mindful perhaps of the need to avoid invoking the image of the bull in the china shop, Celia entitled her opening essay Music Among the Historians rather than Historians Among the Music. Um, but there's still no mistaking the hint of ambivalence which makes her opening remarks into something more than the customary <coughs> slightly tired hymn of praise to interdisciplinary scholarship. Historians and musicologists, she writes, along with most humanists, work today in a Schengen zone of scholarship, where people cross disciplinary borders without hindrance, yet remain conscious of difference in language, custom, knowledge, and ways of going about that work. And acknowledging that ambivalence strikes me as particularly pertinent when trying to think at the interface of history and musicology, where a fundamental divide separates those uh, who possess the latter's analytical skills and those of us like me who don't. Um, and this divide, I think, still, still underpins very different assumptions about what constitutes the object of study uh, and how to approach it, both in ways that are acknowledged and, more importantly, one suspects in ways that aren't. While musicologically trained expert listeners may struggle to make the imaginative leap into the lives of those for whom organized sound figures less as an object of analysis than as just so much sonic wallpaper, it's hard to dispute Applegate's central charge that for, for their part, historians have chosen to understand music by circling around it, and that their accounts of musical culture tend to include everything except the music itself. And the problem, it seems to me, is real. Whether the aesthetic effect that music calls forth seems to ta stand in a timeless space beyond the reach of historicizing analysis, um, whether musicology's unique grammars appear to represent an insurmountable barrier to those not equipped with that discipline's formidable technical skills, or whether the challenge of finding a language with which to verbalize past sonic or melodic effects and the perception of them just seems too intractable, historians have mostly elected to stay well clear. Now, at the same time, uh, it seems to me the wave of subfields spawned by the new cultural history, the history of memory, the history of the senses, the history of the emotions among them, have created plenty of opportunities for historians to think about organized sound in the past. And these now enable us to place the musical object far more firmly at the centre of things, in that they enable us to focus not so much on the work, but on the work that the work does as it moves through the culture of which it's part. And it bears pointing out, of course, that none of those scholarly discourses I mention are owned either by history in particular or by the humanities in general. From sociology to psychology, as far away as neuroscience, those questions of memory, perception, emotion are all the objects of vigorous, open-ended debate within those disciplines. So not only is it inadequate to describe this as an interdisciplinary contact zone, in other words, it's, it's misleading even to think of it as a problem space framed by three or four disciplines. The space itself has no frame. Now it's precisely that then that should embolden us to, uh, to, to draw pragmatically from work in as wide a variety of disciplines as we wish in order to make sense of problems which are still recognizably historical. And that's what I want to do in this lecture, in which I take a history of listening to Richard Strauss's late work, Metamorphosen, which is the music that was playing 
as you came in, to suggest ways of opening up poorly understood aspects of the effective legacies of the Second World War for Germany. Specifically, I'm concerned with exploring cultures of nostalgia as they manifested themselves in the two or three decades immediately following defeat. Now, historians of memory, which is the most established of the, the three subfields that I uh, mention, have for sure uh, already sought to move away from readings of memory culture which reduce sounds and silences to politically strategic expressions determined by contemporary ideological necessity and towards acknowledging the more visceral qualities of memory, its effective contents gradually tuning into the presence of emotions which were unspoken, not only because it was inexpedient to do so, but because they were hard, if not downright impossible, to verbalise. In the context of post-war West Germany, this has manifested itself in a shift away from accounting for post-war silences, uh, silences on the Third Reich, I mean, in terms of Cold War politics, the restoration of tainted elites, or the strategic, mutually beneficial circumspection of a society of former perpetrators in favour of an approach which recognises the shocking long-term impact of massive military violence on individuals, on families, on communities, on polities. To borrow from the language of neuroscience, uh, they've sought to access the, the presence of forms of wordless knowledge amongst their historical subjects. Wordless knowledge which is, is as stubbornly resistant to analysis as it is simultaneously felt by historians to be somehow there. Now, if the emergent field of the history of emotions provides an alternative toolbox with which to open up the contents of that wordless knowledge, it's not also without its challenges. Above all, the predilection uh, for readings of culture rooted in various strands of structuralist post-structuralist thinking in the last two or three decades has predisposed most scholars of the emotions to privileged thinking about the representation or the narrativization of the emotion over the feeling itself and thus to focus on the emotional vocabularies or the, the emotional idioms present in any given society at any given time. Proceeding from the commonplace insight that there's no thought without language and that the availability of language shapes and therefore regulates how individuals think or feel, uh, scholars have discussed the range of visual, verbal languages made available to individuals to understand their own feelings in terms of emotional regime. And the echoes of a Foucauldian emphasis on discipline are unmistakable, uh, even when not explicit. Now this lecture too uh, works inevitably with languages of emotion as it seeks to access the affective dimensions of post-war experience. However, what, what I would see as, as the limitations of the overtly coercive capacities of these languages are such that I prefer the metaphor of landscape. Like a regime, a landscape has shape and structure. It has an overall ecology it evolves slowly, even imperceptibly, and yet after time, it obviously looks different. Its dominant contours constrain in very obvious ways the manner in which individuals move through it, and those contours serve to channel most along broadly defined paths. At the same time, a landscape contains many elements of the random. It allows for local contingencies. It contains a wide variety of possibilities for choice on the part of individuals whose agency is retained as they navigate the terrain, and whose movements through that terrain uh, is part in turn, in turn of what gives it its shape. Now, um, an inaugural lecture is, of course, above all, a ritual. Uh, and being a ritual, uh, it has certain fixed elements. Uh, let me get in there for the customary dig at a neighbouring discipline. Um, it is no more than a tease, and it's a very friendly tease of the musicologists at this point, in that I elect to preface talking about how people listen to a piece of music by saying something about the music itself. Uh, musicologists don't seem to do this these days. Um, Strauss sketched most of his um, metamorphosis in late 1944. He completed the score 
in April 1945. The piece is scored for 23 solo strings. It forms a continuous work, albeit one separated into three sections by two sort of general pauses, the audibility of which depends a little bit uh, on the performance. It's a sad-sounding piece of music. It's written at a sad moment in time when Strauss was feeling rather sad. This musicology isn't half as difficult as it looks. So it's, um, <laughs> now, that's as much as musicologists would permit us to say, or some would permit us to say. And, and to seek to characterise that, um, to seek to characterise the piece um, without entering into and replicating uh, the, the, the very discourse I'm trying to pull apart here is indeed uh, difficult. But there are some clues in the score and there are some contextual clues to suggest that the piece had some kind of broadly programmatic uh, meaning for Strauss and that the piece can't be dissociated from the period in which it was conceived. Very unusually for Strauss, he dated not only the end of the score but also the beginning, suggesting that the day he started writing out the clean version, the 13th of March 1945, was significant. This was the day after the Vienna State Opera House, a key site of Strauss's activity going back to the late 19th century, was destroyed by Allied bombing. And indeed, although nothing connects their contents uh, directly to the specific piece of music, Strauss's letters from the period are replete uh, with distraught references to the destruction of Germany's opera houses and cultural monuments during the war. Now, fortified by these epistolary clues, and encouraged by an early misreading of Strauss's sketchbooks, a long tradition emerged of seeing the Metamorphosum as a composition written specifically in mourning for Munich. In mourning for Munich. That particular myth was dispelled in the 1990s by Timothy Jackson, who argued instead that Strauss's inspiration came from a Goethe poem, Niemand wird sich selber kennen, uh, nobody will come to know himself. <coughs> And that that poem's emphasis on self-reflection, self-criticism, self-transfiguration through self-knowledge embodied a, an expression of belated self-insight on Strauss's part, that his involvement with the Nazi regime had represented a moral failure for which he now repented. Now, to me, the suggestion that Strauss was engaging in an act of self-denazification avant la lettre has more than a faint whiff of musicology's notorious penchant for advocacy. If you like the music, you have to make excuses for the bloke. Um, much evidence remains to suggest that Strauss's concerns returned a strongly narcissistic rather than self-critical um, quality down to the edge, end of the war and beyond. So if the specific association with Munich wasn't there, the destructiveness of war combined with a reflectiveness born of Strauss's advancing years, and he turned 80 in 1944, that combined to foster a mood of profound nostalgia within the composer, whose work and writings during the last years of the war echoed with personal and cultural reminiscences reaching back to the 19th century. His letters following the destruction of the Munich National Theatre, for example, noted not only the catastrophe itself, but that the theatre was, quote, the hallowed shrine of the Tristan and Meistersinger premieres, where I first heard the Freischutz 73 years ago, where my good father played first horn in the orchestra for 49 years. This is going back to the 1870s, 1880s. In 1942, in similar vein, he'd written an essay entitled Memories of the Premieres of My Operas, in which he reminisced over the first performances of his earlier fin de siècle efforts, and in which recollections of the chaotic rehearsals, recalcitrant soloists, poor provincial orchestras, hostile critical reactions which accompanied his early operas are recounted in the light-hearted anecdotal mode of, of one whose memories of the event have been transfigured by the palliative balm of later commercial and critical success. And in 1945, Strauss reworked his Munich and occasional waltz originally written, written in 1939 into the longer Munich a memory waltz, adding a more somber central section in a minor key to the original lilting waltz music that could now only evoke the carefree pleasures of an earlier, more innocent era. 
Now, it would be tempting to see this memory waltz in particular as an example of the self-deluding kitsch which Strauss's great critical nemesis, Theodore Adorno, described as having its own objective origin in the downfall of form and materials into history. For Adorno, this kitsch sustains the memory, distorted and as mere illusion, of a formal objectivity that's passed away. And by serving up past formal entities as contemporary, it has a social function to deceive people about their true situation, to transfigure their existence, to allow intentions that suit some powers or another <coughs> to appear to them in a fairy tale glow. So the memory waltz, in other words, embodies a, a musical enactment of the, of the habit which Hannah Arendt criticised in her travel report of 1950, when she described Germans who mail each other picture postcards still showing the marketplaces, the public buildings, and the bridges that no longer exist. Arendt took this as a sign of, of a general lack of emotion, which she saw as only the most conspicuous outward symptom of a deep-rooted, stubborn, and at times vicious refusal to face and come to terms with what had really happened. Much as Adorno, in the same essay, named Strauss as an example of the good-bad music whose kitschness resides precisely in the fact that it was unrealised, illusory, based on false emotion. Now, measured by the austere standards of Adorno's utopian humanism, few would not be found wanting, not least in Germany at the end of the Second World War. And Strauss was no exception. Yet if the nostalgia which Strauss expressed failed to live up to Adorno or Arendt's normative assumptions about what he and others should have been feeling, it was no less real for that. If anything, one might argue, it was Arendt who'd been looking for the wrong emotion. And indeed, that nostalgia is not only expressed in Strauss's writings, letters, and occasional pieces, it's inscribed in the score of the Metamorphosen itself. The score contains numerous citations of Strauss's own works. Shortly before the end, there's an unmistakable allusion to Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. Most famously, eight bars before the end, Strauss cited the first theme of the funeral march of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, under which he wrote, In Memoriam. Now, to what precisely the citation serves as a monument to Beethoven, to Germany's ruined cities, or to the lost habitus of the cultivated bourgeoisie, it's unclear. But on some level, the piece serves as a lament, as a lament for the loss of German culture. Woven into which are some nostalgic autobiographical reminiscences of an old man nearing the end of his life, sensing that the cultural traditions whose last heir he imagined himself to be was coming to an end. Now, the, the piece was first performed in 1946 by the Collegium Musicum in Zurich under Paul Zacher, who'd commissioned the piece. It was first recorded in 1947 by Herbert von Karajan with the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra in studio sessions which also took in Brahms's German Requiem. At first sight, it would appear to be a musical manifestation of the much uh, analysed victim discourse of post-war society the phenomenon whereby a society which had only recently perpetrated a genocidal war focused its memory work not on the millions of innocent victims of its crimes, but on its own wartime suffering. Embracing a culture of national narcissism which swiftly drove the Holocaust to the margins of public reflection. And there is indeed something which grates about the sight of Herbert von Karajan, the former party member fated as the miracle Karajan, das Wunder Karajan, by the Goebbels press, recording a piece written by the former president of the Reich Music Chamber and composer of festive music for the 1936 Olympics in commemoration of the, of the destruction of German culture just at the moment when images of a liberated Auschwitz were being flashed around the world. Now, by the 1990s, these associations were firmly there in the minds of many commentators, for whom performances of the piece were clearly to be read against the background of what was perceived as the resurfacing of this victim discourse in the context of post-reunification reappraisals of the uh, national past. 
So writing in the Süddeutsche Zeitung of a performance of the piece by the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra in 1991, the journalist Klaus Bennert observed that here, an old man with not an entirely unproblematic past, laments and superlatives have lost the bombed-out cultural treasures of Munich. National theatre, the greatest catastrophe that has ever occurred in my life. In Dresden or Weimar, the Goethe House, the world's most holy shrine, destroyed more than the millions of human victims. And indeed, by the late 20th century, it's possible to speak of a strong underlying critical consensus that the piece had been composed in response to the particular event or the events of the destruction imagined as a specific moment in time. The Neubrandenburger Nordkurier observed in a concert preview in 2005, for example, that under the impression of the destroyed opera houses and concert halls of Berlin, Munich, Dresden and Vienna, Richard Strauss wrote his study for 23 solo string instruments towards the end of the war. The direct association with event and location was reduced to something more simple still, with the Schwäbische Zeitung's description of the piece of Strauss's lament for the destroyed Munich. And the direct connection to the destruction brought by the events of the air war was perhaps asserted most eloquently by the critic of the Frankfurter Rundschau, who described it in 1999 as rubble music, Trümmer music. Now, there are, there are similar emphases uh, in the sleeve notes of recordings made in the 1990s and 2000s, of which uh, there's a considerable upsurge. Um, but the focus on the connections of the piece to the destructiveness of the war within a contemporary culture animated by renewed interest in the event of the bombing is perhaps best illustrated by the album's sleeve work on these recordings. Here you have Heinz Holliger's 1996 recording of the work, um, which takes for its cover an image of the ruins of the iconic Frauenkirche in Munich uh, and evokes the pathos of the partially sunlit ruin. The Brandis Quartet's recording of the sextet version of the composition is adorned with rubble imagery, which includes a, fa a fallen monument. And the Smithsonian Chamber Players release on Deutsche Harmonia Mundi has the iconic image of the statue surveying the ruins of Dresden in a pose of mourning devoid of the promise of redemption. The dominant vocabulary attached to the piece by both reviewers and liner notes in this period is indeed that of mourning. In 1998, uh, the Munich Abendzeitung opined that the piece emerged in the context of wartime destruction of the Munich National Theatre uh, and is thus funeral music. Uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung reviewed the same concert by describing it as a study in horror and mourning. And ten years later, the Berlin Tagesspiegel similarly referred to it as Lacrimose Funeral Music. Now, this reading of the work has its corollary, finally, and this is what actually interests me in this topic, in the ways in which critics attempted to capture the qualities of the piece itself. By the turn of the century, the, the piece communicated to listeners a single continuous emotional register in a similarly continuous uniform tone. The sleeve notes for Holliger's recording spoke of the depressed mood which is audible in every moment of the work. The, the, the Zutkurier and Constance noted that deeply depressed by the events of the time, the aged Strauss appears to have implanted his entire somberness, confusion, and bitterness into this wildly proliferating work. And the Schwäbische Donaldzeitung, uh, meanwhile, heard simply an abundance of depressive sonorities. And in his review of the, the 2009 performance by Kent Nagano, at the Bonn Beethoven Festival, a local critic noted that mourning was positively branded into the half-hour adagio movement by the composer. A great tragedy in one act. Now, the allusions to contemporary events and the immediate context in which the piece had been written were hardly, of course, lost on an earlier generation of historians. Much of the critical language which I've just presented can be found in the responses of the immediate post-war years too. It would be quite possible indeed to, to build a narrative of linear continuity in the critical discourse surrounding the work 
which could be mapped in turn into an underlying uh, continuity in this victim discourse of post-war Germany more generally. The assertion of that continuity would in turn underpin what I think is, is, a, is a quite justifiable critique of the archaeology of more recent focus in German memory culture on the events of the bombing war, with its often unmistakable nationalist, conservative, relativizing proclivities. But to do so would be to miss the presence in the discourse under discussion of a distinctive vocabulary of nostalgia in the post-war era too. Now it would be easy in argumentative pr pursuit of the contrast to overstate the distinctiveness of the um, post-war examples I'm going to show. Like everything, there's a kind of rhetorical artifice here uh, and I'm just trying to tease out uh, the differences. But there's nonetheless a, a clear difference in emphasis between the three decades or so immediately following the Second World War and that visible more recently. A difference which suggests to me the presence of a distinctive emotional landscape in the post-war era, the qualities of which uh, we just haven't explored. Now firstly, when commentators did focus on the mourning uh, quality of the piece, they took as the object of that mourning, not the opera houses themselves, but something broader. In the words of one critic, the piece was a funeral lament for a disappearing world. The Bern-based Morgan Black similarly insisted, these metamorphoses embody a world that has vanished. And when the Collegium Musicum performed the piece in Zurich for a second time in 1958, the Zürcher Spiegel's critic heard an avowal of faith of a mature man to the beginnings and origins of his creativity, an elegiac epilogue to a vanishing world which the composer himself had outlived. So if later commentators framed their discussion in terms of the destructiveness of the bombing war itself, earlier critics heard in it something else in addition, the memory of the world destroyed by that bombing. In other words, post-war critics heard in the piece not only the memory of the event, but the nostalgic reminiscences of a milieu now gone. The memory contents of the piece were understood not so much in terms of the wartime <coughs> narrative of bombing, but rather in a metaphorical sense as embodying a memory of place. And the place is the, the habitus of the cultivated bourgeoisie, the Bildungsbürgertum, in which Strauss had lived and worked since the late 19th century. A habitus with its, with its specific musical institutions, for sure, um, but as befitted a habitus with its broader social uh, and cultural landscapes and its broader mental horizons as well. So the Zurich-based Tageszeitung noted that the premiere, that it sometimes sounds as if it were from the theatre. The whole score is shot through with scenic reminiscences and self-citations. Others focused on more general autobiographical reminiscences. The Basler Nachrichten, for example, note that for all its references to war, there are also happy spirits at work, and that the youthful old man cannot help but recollecting the inspirations of earlier days, including all sorts of reminiscences which allude to scenic moment. Or as the Bernese Morgan Black observed more generally yet, the ending of the war doubtless influenced the formation of the themes, and we perceive at the beginning and at the end the most serious of thoughts, but otherwise this music expresses feelings uh, which may shimmer across to us in a thousand colours, but which are rooted in the past. And what's most striking then about these immediate post-war responses to the music, especially when compared to more recent critical accounts, is, that, is the extent to which they're allied to a different experience of hearing the music itself. Whereas later listeners overwhelmingly heard the tragedy in one act, post-war accounts focus quite clearly uh, on the presence of three distinctive sections in the music, the middle one of which embodies a quite different emotional register. So the Targa's and Tiger's review of the premiere underlined that one could describe this as a piece of nearly half hour long as a funeral symphony, were it not for its middle section, in which all sorts of amours and delights, allerlei amoureuses und beglückendes, are conjured up. The Bernese Morgan Blatt similarly 
emphasised the, the distinctive suggestiveness of these central passages in noting that Strauss begins quite unobtrusively like a funeral song in a dark minor key and with surprising shifts of tone, gradually an allegro grows out of the adagio in which all manner of charming spirits are called forth. With an incomparable inner drive, the composer conjures up once more moments of the most consuming ardour. And the, the link between the transitions in tone and the intimation of nostalgia in between the somber framing sections was underlined then even more clearly by the Neue Zürcher Zeitung's 1958 account of the absolutely convincing image of a monumental arc in three parts, which rose from a muffled, gradually becoming clearly defined march theme into the bright realms of blissful memory, only then to fall back again after an oppressive general pause into the darkness of the beginning again. Now, the work appears to have been performed and recorded comparatively little in the 1970s and into the 1980s, suggesting perhaps a period in which it spoke neither to a generation still able to hear its late romantic, <coughs> nostalgic evocations of a world to which increasingly few had direct autobiographical contact, uh, but not, uh, not at the same time to the still coalescing commemorative concerns of a later generation. And if this partly, no doubt, reflected the ebb and flow of aesthetic tastes, as much as anything directly rooted in the memory culture of the Federal Republic, it bears noting that such a periodization <coughs> maps broadly onto what several scholars have noted in respect of the shifts in the manner in which the air war was remembered in post-war West Germany too. And if I can draw on the, the findings of my older work when looking at Nuremberg, um, it's quite clear that, that there's a sort of transitional period in the late 60s, early 70s, um, at which point people suddenly realise that nobody's actually that interested in the bombing anymore. The last two major commemorative events to mark the wartime destruction of the city were held in 1965 and 1970. And again, it was only in the 1990s, but particularly after the turn of the century, that the same experience became the object of renewed, intense memory work. Now, it's in this sense that the experience of listening to Strauss's Metamorphosen in the late 1940s through to the late 1960s or early 1970s would thus appear to, uh, to constitute an interesting empirical example of the period ear to which scholars of the senses now refer. Drawing, of course, on the idea of a period eye, which has been commonplace in art history for a couple of decade, decades now, people are talking about a period ear too. And that period ear reflects a set of mental and emotional <coughs> dispositions which emerged towards the end of the war and continued across its end, disrupting that conventional sense of 1945 as a caesura. Now, such assertions call forth their own questions, and they pose additional challenges, which I'd like to raise rather than answer in the last five minutes of this lecture. To what extent, firstly, can one locate that period here, not only in a specific temporal, but also a more precise social and cultural context? One of the most thoughtful historians of um, post-war Germany, Jörg Arnold, was a former PhD student of mine and, and whose work, in a sense, um, got me interested in this, has, has argued that the, the nostalgic disposition under discussion here was located in a specifically Bildungsbürgerlich habitus, a, a specifically Bildungsbürgerlich memory culture, the memory culture of the cultivated bourgeoisie. And there's something instinctively compelling about the proposition that this disposition had a particular class location not least because it seems thoroughly counterintuitive to suggest that the memory of pre-war working-class tenement housing, with its cramped quarters, poor sanitation, otherwise harsh way of life, would exert the same, the same nostalgic pull as the apparently lost world of the concert premiere and its attendant glamour. Such intuitive assumptions are consistent with what even scholars whose emphasis is on studying emotions as neural processes, be they electrical or chemical, argue, 
witnessed the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio's assertion that the classes of stimuli that cause happiness or fear or sadness tend to do so fairly uh, consistently in the same individual and in individuals who share the same social and cultural background. Ironically, neuroscience seems to have discovered a language of class just as most historians have all but jettisoned it. And such assertions uh, loop neatly back into, a, into Adorno's acerbic assertion that Strauss's music was at heart a commodity produced to order for the German bourgeoisie. If we seek, of course, we find. Perhaps most notably, given the location, Bavaria, and the timing, 1949, but also the impeccable Bildungsbürgerlich credentials of its author, um, here's Thomas Mann's account of being shown the ruins of Nuremberg by the director of the Germanische Nationalmuseum. I'll never forget how, in the hopelessly ruined city of Nuremberg, the old museum director took us up to the castle so that we might enjoy the view of the city. The tower, the fountain there, he said with trembling voice. Just look, they're still standing. The sites of the Dürer House, the Pirkheimer House, they're still recognisable, aren't they? <coughs> the outline is there. In fact, in a sense, everything is still there. Nothing was there, but he convinced himself he could still see it. And we're back to Arendt's postcards of places that no longer exist. And that, that capacity of visualising something that's no longer there. Now, what's, what's equally striking, though, is the capacity for that nostalgic sensibility to have transcended these obvious forms of social distinction. And there's tantalising evidence to suggest that it had a purchase which went well beyond the middle classes, too. Consider, for example, the decidedly unbourgeois couple Hans and Annie Almuller, a, a railway worker and a cleaner who lived in Nuremberg in a modest apartment just north of the city walls until their deaths at the turn of the century. The visual focal point of their room uh, was a panoramic 18th century engraving of the cityscape uh, with its familiar castle, the Lorenzkirche and the Seebaldkirche, for which the Almullers paid the very handsome sum of 400 Deutschmarks sometime prior to the 1970s. Now, the couple may have bought the print as an investment. They may have just found it simply decorative on a level which refuses analysis. Um, but the fact that they spent what would have been a very large sum of money uh, for a working class household and displayed it so prominently for some 30 years, if not more, suggests to me that it was an object of emotional identification which went beyond the conceit of ownership. Um, and the fact that the print hung on their walls until the second of them passed away at the turn of the century raises for me intriguing questions which I can't answer about the temporalities of the effective landscapes discussed in this lecture, their relationship to the presence of a period ear in respect of the musical object considered above, and the problem of how historians connect and narrate these related yet distinct histories of memory, of the senses and the emotions more generally. Looked at as a problem of demography, it wouldn't be difficult to explain the fading presence of the nostalgic memory culture to which I've drawn attention as the product of the slow but certain dying out of the generations which experienced the war, the wartime and the post-war eras. Generations of which Hans and Annie were very late representatives. And to see the period here is directly correlated to the same. Pursued in the micro-historical context of one working class family's living room, however, the presence of a more continuous, stable emotional landscape may be discernible. The very unchangingness of which poses a fundamental challenge to a discipline so geared towards narrating change. At the very least, in discovering that emotions are not essentializable, and in pursuing the, the insights that that analytic uh, insight affords us, we should avoid, it seems to me, the opposite temptation of seeing them always as a direct function, always as a direct reflection, or a direct correlate of something else. 
including other historically and culturally specific phenomena such as the senses. Much as we've already discovered in respect of memory then, if both the emotions and the senses are essentially anything, they are essentially irreducible. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.